Hello everyone, I'm Jana Garcia, Marketing Manager here at Rigor. Thank you for joining today's webcast, Six Essential Strategies for Integrating Performance Testing into the CI-CD Process. With me today is Rich Howard, Founder and CEO of Optimal, a digital consulting company that helps enterprises measure and optimize the performance of their websites. Rich and his team offer a range of services, including front-end monitoring and optimization, deep dive analysis, seasonal readiness preparation for Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and similar high volume events, content delivery network setup and tuning, APM setup, and load and stress testing. Rich's knowledge of the performance space spans the full stack, front-end, back-end, infrastructure, and content, led by a strong focus on data, analytics and insights, and customer experience. His clients include Sephora, Total Wine, William Simona, Vodafone Group, and The Hartford. Also with me is Billy Hoffman. As a former web security hacker, Billy was paid to find vulnerabilities and exploit in the front end weaknesses in public websites and applications. That was all it took to ignite his interest and passion to pursue a career in web performance. Now, the CTO of Rigor, Billy, builds and innovates solutions necessary to drive performance forward. Billy will be helping us moderate the, today's talk and lead the question and answer later in our broadcast. For many of us, automated performance testing is a dream. It's the key to faster deploys, more streamlined workflows, and better user experience for our customers. But integrating performance testing into your DevOps processes can be a very intense and difficult process, impacting multiple teams and involving a broad spectrum of tooling, strategies, and best practices. It all starts with a clear understanding of the types of performance management solutions available today and a deeper awareness of how these tools work together to drive the results that you want. Today, Rich and Billy will explore the six classes of performance and optimization solutions that you should be leveraging, in addition to the insights and power behind certain tooling combinations and the best practices and considerations for how to level up your current site performance and optimization strategy. Now, two housekeeping, two, two housekeeping notes before we get started. This presentation is being recorded. Within the next few days, we will email everyone who registered a link to download the slides and the recording. After the presentation, we may have time for a short Q&A session. So please submit your questions at any time during the presentation by using the Q&A feature in your GoToWebinar panel. Rich and Billy will answer as many questions as time permits. Good afternoon, everybody. The purpose of this talk really is to uh, review some of the tools and strategies around uh, CI/CD pipeline. The key takeaways here really are to understand the strengths and weaknesses of six particular classes of performance management tools, how to leverage combinations of tools to drive better insights and outcomes, the benefits of combining different solutions together to gain more visibility into site performance, also how to incorporate performance and optimization tools into the CI CD process and strategies for automating performance testing and improving your performance strategy. I'm going to begin this with a poll question. So the question is, um, are you currently using a CI or CD uh, type tool? Uh, if you guys could answer this, that would be great. Thank you. Yep, so we just launched the uh, poll that'll be in the webinar sideboard. People are starting to collect responses. Um, Rich, I'd ask you, when was kind of the first time that you were introduced to a CI CD tool? I, I think the first time was back in 2015. I was uh, doing some work with William Sonoma at the time, and uh, they were just introducing this into their pipeline. So. Uh, they actually had some build and release engineers and uh, it was great gaining exposure to that because, you know, watching that, watching them as an organization sort of transform from a series of manual build steps into uh, into running an automated pipeline, it, it really made their deployments a lot smoother. 
Yes, exactly. And I, I think this is a great question for us to start with because it's really about how you sort of take those first steps into automating some of those repetitive tasks. And humans are terrible mm -hmm. about doing the same kind of silly thing over and over again and we'll introduce mm -hmm. mistakes. So whenever you're able to automate something, that's great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Thanks. We had a whole lot of people answer. So it looks like the uh, results back here are we had 43% of people say yes, uh, continuous integration, 29% uh, say um, CI, CD, and um, uh, um, uh, yeah, CI and CD. 14% uh, said nope, they're considering it. 14% said they don't know where to start. Um, do you find this is common that people sort of struggle where to start or they're thinking about it, but you know, want to know what that first next step is? Uh, I definitely do. And it's interesting, actually, because these results actually look better than what I kind of thought may be out there. You know, I was looking at some data back from a report in 2018, and I think it said something like around 50 percent of organizations have uh, CICD uh, pipelines embedded into their organization. So it seems like, you know, this is definitely something that's top of mind uh, for companies. And, you know, there's a lot more companies out there now that are beginning to make those first steps. Um, what I do see within certain organizations is, you know, depending on uh, depending on their existing deployment process, it may make it very difficult to do this. And, you know, one of the one of the challenges is really around the automation of testing. And, you know, there's there's sometimes test cases within particular applications um, that are very difficult to automate. So um, there, there's always, I think, going to be some level of um, resistance for certain um, certain companies and certain applications, but it, it seems like uh, based on this poll data that you know we're we're definitely getting some traction, which is great. Excellent. Well, with that sort of you know touch point about what people are using or what they're interested in, let's start diving into the different performance optimization tools that are available. Mm -hmm. So what we've got here is a chart that I put together, and this is really looking at a series of optimization and performance tools that we use across um, across our uh, across our development cycle. So I'll begin with a class called Real User Monitoring. Uh, what this really is is the Adobe Analytics, uh, specifically for front-end performance, but also for user experience as well. What you're actually able to capture here is uh, all customers, all pages, all page views, and all data. So it's every single every single page you can measure the performance of that particular page. What this gives you is a really great understanding of overall performance trends, and it gives you the actual numbers that um, that you're experiencing from a customer perspective. The challenge with this data is that it's actually quite a noisy set of data because you've also got the network conditions uh, inherent in this data as well so for instance if you have a mobile user and they're accessing over a slow internet connection you will actually see that in the in the data and what it'll do is it'll give you like a, a really good uh, good range of of measurement um, but when you're trying to optimize a site, it becomes very difficult to be able to uh, look at that and sort of say very prescriptively, you know, here, here is kind of the performance problem that we're experiencing. So then we move on to synthetic data. Synthetic data, uh, examples of this would include rigor monitoring, catch point, speed curve, and web page test. The nice thing about synthetic data is that it's a clean room and controlled measurement of uh, front end performance. It's it's agent based, and what you can also do is uh, script this to make use of uh, multiple steps within a user journey. So, in the case of an e-commerce client, uh, typically they would look at a buy journey, which would include um, you know the home page to a, a category page, and then off to a product page. They might add that product to a basket, and then they would go through a checkout funnel. So you, you can you can follow a very specific path and measure the performance of that specific path. This is really great for transactional monitoring. So if you want to understand whether whether a particular user journey is uh, responsive and returning back same data, uh, this this will really help you. Uh, this is also great for debugging performance issues as well, because what you've effectively done is that you've stabilized the connection to a particular bandwidth profile with a um, with a with a latency and with a set packet loss, and so. 
you're able to sort of understand uh, over time sort of what's happening uh, from a performance perspective. This is also really great for QA environment certification. So when you're when you're trying to look at your performance data, uh, real user monitoring is not great for uh, QA environment simply because you haven't got a lot of sort of real traffic sort of going through your QA environment. And so with the synthetic data, you're able to set that up and you're able to run that at a at set frequency in your QA environment, which means that you're picking up performance issues before they actually go live into production. Uh, what it's not so great at is uh, measuring the performance of every single page. So you can set up monitors for every single page, but chances are, you know, on a modern website, you've got thousands of pages. And so trying to do that is is both uh, very, um, uh, very time consuming and also very costly as well. So uh, typically what we do when we're setting up synthetic journeys is that we want to look at uh, categories of page templates. So instead of measuring the performance of every single product page, we might only want to measure the performance of a handful of them. And so we kind of look at it more from a sort of page templating perspective and, and sort of more in general. Whereas, you know, with the run data, you know, what we can do is actually measure the performance of, you know, 10,000 product pages if we want to do that. And then we can start to identify maybe the, the slowest product page. And, you know, that slowest product page may be because it has a, a more complicated uh, template or it could be that it's got some unoptimized content on that page. Then we go to load and stress tools. And these are really a different class of performance measurement tool. What we're really trying to answer here is the question of, you know, when we place a large load on our web servers, are they going to be able to uh, to cope with that? Will our entire infrastructure stack be able to cope with that as well? Um, what this is um, what this is not so great at is really kind of measuring customer experience because with this class of tools, we're not necessarily executing the JavaScript on the page. We're not including the full page render metrics either. And chances are we're also not including any of the third party integrations, although there may be a, a case for including some of those, depending on how critical that component is within your flow. Then we move on to application performance monitoring or application performance management. Uh, this is really a set of tools that we would use in production. So examples of, examples of this would be Dynatrace, New Relic, App Dynamics, and Datadog. What this helps us to do is to understand the performance of individual servers or business transactions. It really helps us to be able to deep dive and debug issues with uh, slow database queries or issues with uh, internal configuration. Maybe that the network link between the application servers and the web servers is not spiked high enough. And this will kind of give us a better view of what exactly is, uh, is happening from a, from a back end perspective. What this is not so great at is resolving front-end issues and also uh, resolving issues with uh, third-party integrations and external integrations unless you uh, have APM data access to their APM data as well. And ch chances are with a third party, they, they don't generally give you that level of access. Then we come on to optimization tools. So examples of this would be rigor optimization, Google Lighthouse, also some other tools as well. What these are really doing is saying, well, you know, we, we know that we've identified some performance issues. What can we actually do to start to fix those? So uh, what they will do is that they will give you a, a view of your performance versus a series of uh, best practice recommendations that they make. And then based on that, you can sort of say, well, yeah, we need to fix this issue, this issue, this issue, and this issue. What these are not so great at is that they they're not necessarily taking a measurement over uh, over time or a geography or a device. You know, in the case of Google Lighthouse, you run it as a as a one off. Uh, you can integrate it into a CI/CD pipeline so you can schedule that to run more frequently. Uh, what they're also not doing is looking at uh, performance over geography or uh, over a multiple different types of device. So. Um, they're, they're also not so great with user flows and also not so great with authenticated journeys either. 
Oh, and also the so the title of this talk is really around uh, six tools. There's, um, you'll see here on this slide actually we've got five. The sixth tool, which combines all of this together, which is super important, is people. So uh, people are actually the the glue that kind of bring all of this together. You know, without people actually working these tools and um, understanding how to react based on this data, uh, the tools actually don't really kind of function at all. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's just really important to sort of highlight that, uh, you know, in terms of uh, building a team and, you know, sort of delivering performance, purchasing the tools is one thing, you know, uh, embedding this into the uh, into the process, into the development, into your development life cycle, and then bringing the, the people in uh, to analyze the data and make use of the data is uh, super important. Excellent, and that, that actually brings us to our next poll, which I'll go ahead and I'll talk, which is kind of given those classes of performance tools, we're super interested in understanding what are some of the different tools that people are using now. Um, you know, Rich, I, you, you and I have talked a lot, usually at a conference, usually with a beer or cocktail, about how uh, it, there's a maturing process with these tools and that often you start with kind of some basic monitoring and then you move to maybe flows and more um what's sort of the the place where you see people start using tools and then how do they sort of expand as their their needs mature mm -hmm. yeah i often see people starting with uh load and performance first of all you know the the big question and the fundamental question is you know when we uh when we have a peak event or when we have a lot of traffic on our site are we going to be able to sustain that load and will we be able to deliver a consistent user experience? So, you know, if you look back to when we first started building websites in, you know, the 90s and the 2000s, you know, this was the, the big thing that was always kind of on our mind was, you know, do we have enough server infrastructure to be able to cope with a load, particularly, you know, when we have a, a, a you know, a large sort of major scale event. Um, you know, then, then we kind of moved into synthetic tooling and, you know, this, this really started to begin to use sort of uh, real browsers and, you know, sort of measure based on what a what an end user would experience. So, you know, that, that really sort of came about in, I would say, sort of 2005, 2006, 2007. You know, Steve Souders came out with his golden rules. People started to focus more and bring performance into the into the space of how, how is this actually impacting our, our end users and what can we do on the front end and the server infrastructure and to be able to tune and optimize for performance. Subsequent to that, then the, the RUM tools really kind of came out and they, they started to uh, to mature. You've got uh, people like Phil Tellis who wrote the Boomerang tag library and you know that has really been sort of instrumental in terms of being able to capture you know sort of real user metrics on on pages you, you'll see that you know the majority of uh, rum tools out there actually use boomerang as sort of an underlying framework because it's um so it's, uh, it's been such a useful tool over the years in terms of you know sort of organizations and maturity you know i often uh, see an organization they might have one or two of these tools and then they they realize actually they need maybe a, a couple more of them as well so depending on whether you've got the people on the on the end that can can work those tools and get something meaningful out of them you know typically they begin with load and load and stress tools and then they add in either rum or synthetic and then eventually they realize that they need both the rum and the synthetic data as well yeah i i've seen very much the same thing where sort of people started with you know load test tools and APM tools, and then they sort of move to outside in. I think it also is very telling that, like, from your previous slide, that there's not, there's no silver bullet. <laughs> and mm -hmm. any veteran that tells you one, including one on this, you know, webinar, including myself, we would be lying if we said there's just one tool. And at mm -hmm. point that there are some use cases where these excel and some use cases where they're not. APM's awesome um, for people who have really, really heavy backends. Uh, but then when I talk to marketing people, they have a WordPress site and the back end is not the problem, but making sure that, you know, all their MarTech technology is loading and not stopping the call to action from working mm -hmm. is critical. Um, you put Absolutely. that in somebody who's, you know, trying to optimize uh, database queries or things like that. They're, it's like they're from two different worlds, but they're both working towards building a web app that's benefiting the business. And so I think answer to this kind of comes from where you sit inside the organization um, and what you're tasked with, as well as sort of 
as you sort of grow in your needs and some of these other use cases like, huh, like synthetics tells us everything's good, but what actually are the real users experiencing? Um, it, it kind of you know, grows with you. Absolutely. And it, it's interesting as well, because I, I see within different organizations that they typically have different challenges. You know, one of my clients that I'm working with right now definitely has a, a challenge around the number and the integration of third party tags. You know, they're running probably over 100 tags on their pages right now. So, you know, it, it becomes very clear that, you know, that's the that's the area that they need to focus on. And certainly other organizations I've worked with have, you know, difficulty with slow backend calls and configuration of their content delivery network, you know, because they, they're they building sort of very custom, very unique pages that are based on based on the user in the session itself. And so, you know, they end up having to sort of re-architect those pages in order to be able to improve their performance because, you know, their they're real bottleneck is, you know, being able to, you know, get some initial content onto the screen because their, their base HTML page takes, say, three or four seconds to load. So... Excellent. Well, I think that's a great segue back into, you know, once you, you kind of consider these different tools, how do you start understanding what your goal should be and how do you start deploying them into a CI CD workflow? Absolutely. And it, it's interesting. So from a from a goals perspective, and I, I think it, it's sort of fair to say that this slide could cover both goals and requirements as well, and that there's kind of a difference between setting goals versus uh, setting requirements. So Normally, when I work with clients, what I'm trying to do is to understand sort of what their core requirements are. And in a lot of cases, they'll come back to me and say, well, we, we basically want to maintain our current performance and we don't want to get any slower. So uh, typically what I will do is I'll work with them to understand, you know, sort of based on that, you know, where are they at right now, which means that we need to benchmark them. And then also, um, where do they want to be in six months time or 12 months time? You know, if they if they know that their their, their pages are taking, say, six seconds to load, then uh, they may say, well, you know, we're at six seconds right now. We want to maintain that as a current performance level. And also, you know, our goal is that within 12 months time, we want to be down to two and a half or three seconds. So important sort of distinction to make there you know requirements versus goals uh two categories both really important to sort of start thinking about uh from an optimization perspective so when when i'm sort of defining goals with clients you know what i'm typically trying to do is to create what i call sort of smart goals you know so it's specific measurable attainable relevant and time bound so as we look across the different classes of tools, you know, we can see that you would be able to define different goals and be able to measure those using specific tools. So if we take an availability goal, for instance, we sort of say we want uh, five nines of transactional availability. That is, uh, you know, we want to make sure that the system is is um, not only up and responsive, but also responds back with a, a valid response to a transactional request. And then also that we could say that there's no memory leaks in the application. So in order to be able to measure that, what we really need to do is to look both at synthetic tooling and also look at APM tooling as well. Then we look at a uh, customer experience goal. So this would be a production goal. What we want to say here is that the home page is visually complete in less than 2.8 seconds for the 85th percentile of users across desktop and mobile. In terms of measuring this sort of goal, what you really want to be looking at is RUM and synthetic tooling for this, because this is more of a customer experience goal. And really the the, the single source of truth of data here should be, uh, should be RUM data if the RUM system is able to capture a measure, a metric like visually complete, which in some cases it can, in some cases it can't. There's, there's some complicated uh, reasoning behind why that's a difficult metric to capture from a RUM perspective. I won't go into that, but um, uh, typically if uh, if RUM is not able to capture a metric, chances are synthetic will. Then we look at a customer experience uh, goal in pre-production. So this is average page load time to visually complete in pre-production less than 2.5 seconds. Typically in pre-production environments, because we're not getting a lot of users visiting the site, trying to measure this using a real user monitoring tool is not going to be the best way to go about that. So uh, synthetic tooling can really kind of help us out there because, you know, we can use synthetic tooling to set up a measurement and uh, 
take that measurement over a you know over an over a time interval so we can say every five minutes we want to hit you know these particular 10 pages or 10 page templates and we take a full measurement and we've got our our, our full waterfall charts and also uh video capture screenshots to sort of show us uh, what what's what exactly is happening from a performance perspective then we move into performance budgets. Uh, these are more for developers, but these are great targets to have because what we know is that when we optimize a website and follow specific rules, we have a much greater chance of being able to hit our performance goals. So we may say organizationally that what we want to do is to decrease the amount of JavaScript that we have on the homepage to less than 500 kilobytes. And we also want to check to make sure that we have no images more than 200 kilobytes in size. Now, uh, typically to check this, you're going to use either a synthetic tool or you're going to use an optimization type tool, which will actually be able to measure your site against a series of best practices and give you a set of data that you can begin to interpret to understand whether or not you're sort of reaching those goals or not. Then we move on to a, finally onto a load and scaling uh type performance goals so this would be a sustained load of 5,000 virtual users making 1200 tra transactions per minute across a shopping journey with 1.5 seconds of page load time so this would be the base html plus the any api calls that are made and we don't include any network or bandwidth throttling there so so it's a, a slightly different performance target that you would set when you're running a sort of a, a load test or a scalability test because chances are you're not going to be really kind of measuring the response time of you know some of the third party integrations or measuring the response time of some of your media assets okay Uh, can we go back one slide? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so where this starts to become really more powerful is when you start to combine the tools together. So if you look at synthetic uh, tooling plus optimization tooling, what this does is it gives you the ability to explore optimization recommendations in deeper detail and to validate the re recommendations on waterfall charts. So optimization tooling, you know, what it's doing is that it will be checking your uh, your web page against a series of guidelines and best practice. As uh, as developers, what we really want to do is to validate, you know, what what impact is that really having from a performance perspective, and then also, uh, is this the the most critical defect that we need to be uh, tackling right now? And so, you know, sort of digging down and looking at some of the waterfall charts really kind of helps you to understand, you know, what exactly is going on and uh, to give you a bit more debug data to say, well, yeah, this, this actually is something we can clearly see that for the majority of users, you know, this, this is gonna be causing problems. Then we move on to run plus APM data. When you combine these two tool sets together, what this does is gives you the ability to see a combined front end and back end view of the data. So typically what we would do is that we would start off with the run data and run data would allow us to understand what the slowest pages on the website what which pages are slowest on the website what we can then do is dig down into that page uh, take a look at a waterfall chart and you know if we identify for instance that it's a, a back-end call or a, a server call uh, that's causing the issue we can then start harnessing the apm tooling to sort of say well, let, let's run a query against this particular page and then see exactly what's happening. And from there, we can deep dive into it and say, oh yeah, we, we actually see that we've got a really slow database query that's happening every single time the person calls that page. What we actually need to do is to either uh, redesign our uh, database schema or we need to go in and you know add some indexing or uh, perform an optimization on the, on the query that we've actually written. Uh, alternatively, we may want to add some caching to, to fix this particular issue. When we move on to RUM and synthetic data, when you combine these two data sets together, what this does is it gives you the ability to deep dive into the RUM data and it also the ability to uh, refine your synthetic scripts based on uh, RUM page view data. 
So uh, run like an uh, analytic solution will actually give you uh, uh, an analysis of which pages are most commonly being accessed on your site. And so you can begin to use that data to inform which pages you may want to look at from a synthetic, uh, synthetic transactional uh, flow and synthetic view. So, you know, for instance, if you have uh, 20 product pages that are most common, you're probably going to want to add some of those into your uh, in, into your flow for uh, a user uh, that's completing a buy journey. Uh, the other thing is, is that you can also uh, start to set up uh, bandwidth profiles based on the run data as well. So, you know, from a synthetic perspective, um, you know, most modern or the, you know, the really good modern synthetic tools out there give you the ability to throttle your bandwidth based on a upload and a download speed. And, you know, with the run data, you can sort of segment and understand, you know, how many users are accessing via 3G or 4G connection and, you know, what is their tip, what is their particular speed. So that gives you a little bit more clarity in terms of what's happening from a run perspective and a synthetic perspective as well. So then finally, we move on to load testing and APM. So when you combine those two tools together, uh, what this really helps us to do is to understand what's happening from a backend perspective as we're running a load test. So it kind of gives you like a, a second level of debug information to sort of say, well, you know, we're, we're now executing a, a large load against our website. And, you know, here is, here is what we're able to see. You know, we're able to see in real time that we've got a lot of transactions going to this particular messaging server and that messaging server is beginning to get overloaded. And as a result of that, we're getting increased latency coming back to the end user. So you can trace it like all the way from the, from the start to the end, uh, which is quite powerful. Okay, so in terms of bringing this all together into a coherent strategy, what I like to do is to uh, define what a, uh, a well-rounded approach looks like. So for me, a well-rounded approach makes use of uh, multiple classes of tools to be able to surface the data that's most relevant to your business. And going back to a point that Billy and I were making earlier, uh, you know, different, different businesses have uh, different performance challenges and it's only through looking at data from multiple tools that you can really kind of dig into you know what's actually causing those and you know sort of come up with a uh, recommendation on how to how to fix or improve that particular issue uh, next one is that it's ongoing so ideally uh, performance testing you know, should be executed on a regular basis and should be baked into uh, your, your development process as well. Also, ideally, if you're running CICD, that it's built into your pipeline. Uh, next one is that it provides a feedback loop uh, to help you improve performance during the next iteration of your work. One of the things I see with uh, some of my clients is that they, um, you know, they the, their teams are very much heavily focused on releasing new features and uh, fixing fixing issues, and sometimes performance gets uh, sidelined. And as a result of that, um, you know, sort of uh, performance begins to degrade over time. So uh, the important thing here really is to uh, to look at performance from a cultural perspective, and you know, sort of start to start to get people excited and enthused about performance, so that you know, it actually uh, becomes, you know, part of the part of the design of whatever it is that you're building. Uh, next one is, is baked into the culture of the organization. So, yeah, this is this is really around, you know, sort of making sure that um, making sure that people understand, you know, sort of why it's important and then also identifying those people that are strong advocates for performance that can can help you um, in that journey. And the final one is that it involves multiple teams. So uh, what I like to do is to try and get a lot of different teams engaged in performance activities because every every team that's involved in you know building a website or building an application you know has a has a role to play. Um, you know, so this this sort of spans from front end, back end, uh, design, content, infrastructure, product, you know, business and leadership as well. So it kind of starts, you know, sort of from the business and from leadership, and ideally it sort of disseminates down. And you know, with, within each team, you know, chances are there's there's somebody that's going to be a strong advocate for performance. You know, somebody that uh, that really understands, you know, why it's important to maintain good performance, and you know, has an interest in helping out with some optimization efforts. 
Okay, so what I wanted to do then is to show a couple of examples of how CI CD tooling can be integrated. Oh, sorry, how performance tooling can be integrated into a CI CD process. So the first example we have here is an integration of Jenkins and Rigor. So what we can see here, this is the Jenkins main screen. And the first thing that we need to do is to check for the installation of a plugin. There's a rigor optimization plugin that you can add to your integration. After that, we then need to go and get that configured. And uh, part of that configuration is going to be an API key and then also a performance test ID as well. What we can also do is to set some criteria for if we want to fail that build based on a performance threshold or a performance score. So now we're in the rigor optimization interface and we can see some of the tests that uh, ran previously via the, via the integration. We also have the ability to edit this particular test configuration as well. Uh, so for instance, you know, rigor optimization tool has about 300 different uh, optimization best practices that it's using. And, you know, from that, we can sort of say, well, you know, some of, some of these are important to us, some of them are not. We also have the ability to tweak uh, these settings so we can change the location of this test and we can also change the bandwidth profile of the test that we're running as well. So here we've got a list of uh, all of the checks that uh, rigor optimization tool is doing. So for instance, you know, if we haven't minified our JavaScript files and we run this tool against the page, we can actually fail the build based on the fact that the minification process hasn't completed. So then what you wanna do in terms of your pipeline is to make sure that there's a step uh, in there that will actually uh, go and auto minify all of your JavaScript files. And then that, that sort of uh, case is passed. So this is just looking at the console output of this particular test that we're running. And this normally takes a minute or two to execute. Okay, it looks like the optimization tool is now scanning the HAR file and capturing the page content. Okay, so that's now been completed and we get a full performance report that's available uh, inside of the rigor optimization portal and also that data based on our pass fail criteria is also available in Jenkins to pass or fail that build as well. So, you know, with these tools, what you can, with this particular tool, you know, you can start to allocate performance budgets for your site. So you can set a rule in here to, to say if your, um, uh, if your JavaScript is over a certain size and fail the build. Uh, you can also uh, get this to measure your site against um, uh, the performance best practices and then pass or fail the build uh, based on that as well. So the next integration we have here is Jenkins and Lighthouse. So Lighthouse is a Google, uh, Google tool that they use for measuring performance against a series of best practices. Okay, so with this one, uh, we actually install this as an NPM module. So the first thing that we need to do is to make sure that we have this installed. Uh, by running this npm command, we uh, we download and install the latest copy. And then what we want to do is to create a file, file called package.json, which effectively has our, uh, our Jenkins uh, configuration script for running uh, this particular tool and then generating a report for us. So then what we want to do is we want to test this integration and make sure that it's actually working as intended. And then what we want to do is just take a look at this report and make sure that it contains the information that we're looking for. Okay, so we've opened up a new browser and we've got a full copy of the report uh, coming from Lighthouse. So with this, you know, now, now that we've tested this, we've made sure that the integration is working. Uh, we can actually uh, start to integrate this into our process and we can also use this to pass and fail the build as well. A uh, nice part about this is that it also gives you uh, metrics based on you know usability and SEO scoring as well so you can you can start to do something interesting with that data. Okay so then from a Jenkins perspective um, let's take a look at the integration here. So Okay. So 
So what we need to do is make sure that we have an HTML publisher plugin available. And then if we go into the configuration of this particular build project, what we can see here is that we've got a shell command that we execute, which is the uh, Lighthouse CI command that we defined. And then we publish the HTML report to a specific location so that we can then access that uh, once the build has been completed. Cool. And yeah, those reports are available uh, directly inside of the uh, directly inside of the Jenkins interface, uh, which is pretty cool. So the final integration uh, that I wanted to share with you guys today is the Jenkins plus Cloud Test integration. So Cloud Test is a an Akamai tool that they use for uh, load and performance testing. It's a um, it's a tool that they have available that you can either run your own test servers or they have a series of test agents that you can make use of as well. So they're able to do a, a sort of global uh, global load test of your website. So for this, we need to enable the plot plugin and also make sure that we have the Sosta plugin enabled as well. Okay, uh, we then have the ability inside of here to set up a composition. So we've defined a composition inside of the cloud test interface, and we have then defined some threshold values as well. Uh, these can be used to pass or fail the build. And this is the uh, plot plugin data, which gives us the ability to import the, uh, the graphs and the charts of the output of this test inside of Jenkins so we can view it all inside of one interface. So if we look at the script that we've defined inside of here, we effectively are navigating across several different pages and we've just got a very simple composition. I think we defined, you know, a small test of, you know, five or six users. Okay. And yeah, we can see from our previous runs, you know, as we've performed a build, we're also performing this load test as well. And then we have access to a full data set inside of the cloud test portal. And yeah, we can see the response times and we also get a, a view of this inside of Jenkins as well. So um, because we've installed the plot plugin, it actually uh, sends all of this data uh, through into uh, the plot plugin, and then for every every build of the site, we get a chart which shows us um, shows us the performance of um, both particular individual pages, and then also overall against the whole site as well. Okay, so so then we come onto the question of you know if we're if we're trying to introduce performance tooling into our pipeline, you know um, what do we need to do to define it? So ideally. Uh, when we're building and designing a CI/CD pipeline, we want to introduce um, most, if not all, of the classes of tools into uh, into our pipeline. You know where they where they sort of make sense. You know for an individual company or an individual business. In the lower environments, typically what we're doing is deploying synthetic load uh, load testing and optimization tools. And then in the higher environments, we're also deploying uh, we're deploying uh, synthetic uh, load APM and RUM tooling into this. Uh, good performance testing also automates as much of the testing as is humanly possible. In reality, you know, sort of performing load tests in production can be can be tricky, you know, because you know we're load testing against a live site, and they often have to be scheduled, you know, such that they're not going to be impacting the end user. And so, you know, especially for uh, continuous um, continuous delivery type web you know sort of websites. Uh, what we really want to do is to schedule those 
um, production load tests to happen uh, outside of normal business hours. And so it breaks the methodology a little bit, but we have to sort of still think about, you know, the sort of business conditions under which we're operating as well. So there, there's there's kind of a, a bit of a balance there, really. Uh, good performance testing is also comprehensive in its coverage of both pages, device types, and user scenarios. It gives you the ability and flexibility to, to grow and to make more comprehensive over time. And it also includes what we call infrastructure as a code. Inf in, sorry, infrastructure as code. So this is performance test cases and CDN configurations that are checked into the repository and executed as code as well. So in an ideal world, what we want to do is that you know the developers when they build a new feature a new page within the site we want to be able to add this into our configuration so that this then automatically gets added into our uh, performance testing as well okay so what i've got here is an example of a pipeline and you know different organizations have different requirements for what's included in their pipeline uh, the primary steps that i've listed here are code build and test uh, staging deployment uat deployment uh, production release, and then also the testing and monitoring phase that we typically go into once we've performed a new release. The steps that are performance specific I've highlighted in yellow over here. So if we look at the stage where we're actually coding, you know, at this point, we're building some great code. Uh, you know, we've got a series of uh, new features that we're getting ready to uh, getting ready to introduce. At this point, the developers uh, should be adding in any optimizations that they would like to apply you know just to kind of make sure that they're building things as performant as possible uh, they're also writing some new unit tests to you know make sure that they are testing the new feature that they've created uh, they also update the load test logic as well so this is configuration as code sort of really kind of comes in uh, similarly uh, any configuration code for um, cdns or containers uh, gets updated at this point a commit is made to the repository when we go to the build and test phase, what we then do is that we're checking out a copy of the branch. Uh, we're deploying this to a, a test, to a pre-production environment. We're running a series of unit tests, and then we're also running some code quality tests as well. When we get into staging, we've sort of passed our build so far. We deploy this to a staging environment. We might be running some more unit tests and running some more code quality tests. At this point, we can begin to introduce some more performance tooling into the space. So. This is a really great opportunity to introduce synthetic checks and then also to run optimization checks to make sure that we're sort of working within our performance budgets. Provided everything's complete at that point, then we get to a deployment into a UAT or a perf environment. And at this point, uh, we perform the deployment. And then after that, we're able to uh, check the CDN config logic. So this may be the first point at which the website has been uh, placed into an environment that's in front of a CDN. You know, this is a really great opportunity to make sure to sort of run all of our checks again to make sure that there's no major issues, you know, the sort of combined CDN configuration and the code configuration as well. Finally, um, at this point, we run some automated load testing in the perf environment. And, you know, this, this load testing may be a, a scaled version of what we actually uh, are looking at in production, but it, at this point, it'll give us a, a much greater idea of, you know, whether whether we've introduced any uh, performance issues, particularly on the back end. Provided everything is okay at that point, then we get ready for a production release. Um, so we make our deployment to production. Uh, we do a, a test of our CDN config logic again, uh, deploy any CDN config updates, uh, flush our CDN cache, and then run automated sanity tests as well. Finally, when we get into the test and monitoring phase, so this is post-deployment, uh, at this point then what we want to do is to monitor our application error logs and you know make sure that we're not hitting any thresholds or seeing anything untoward as a result of the release. Uh, we're also monitoring APM tools and run tools as well to make sure that you know uh, user traffic hasn't been impacted in any way and the core systems are running and stable as expected. Uh, also at this point we'll want to run uh, synthetic checks in production to make sure that we continue to have good transactional availability. In some cases a release may break the synthetic script so at that point then we may need to go back in and uh, fix those scripts. Also, finally, we uh, will want to schedule our periodic uh, load test in production as well. And once again, outside of uh, business hours normally for that one. So uh, typically, 
um, typically that gets scheduled um, for a later time. So in summary, uh, good performance um, or true performance testing involves a range of tools. It's, it's not just one tool. Uh, it's, it's in reality, it's several. There, there isn't a golden solution that kind of does everything because the, the tooling is also specialized for particular use cases. Combining tooling together gives you strength and it gives you a clear understanding of what's really occurring. And it, it helps you to diagnose and to fix, you know, different problems that the, uh, that the technology stack may have over time. It's really important to test early and often. Uh, you'll get much better results if optimization is part of your process and not an afterthought. And I, I'll say this based on experience, you know, I've seen a lot of organizations that will do their uh, performance testing uh, much later down the line when it then becomes costly to fix something, you know. So, um, you know, particularly for Black Friday, Cyber Monday events or when you get into holiday period, you know, a lot of systems get locked down into code freeze. And so, you know, trying to trying to push changes through at that point can be uh, very challenging, if not impossible. Um, when you're looking at incorporating these tools into a CI CD pipeline, it's uh, it makes sense to think up front, you know, sort of what the design of that pipeline should be. And, you know, um, there's there's a lot of different ways to uh, to build that pipeline. And, you know, some some ways are better than others. So it's uh, it's good to put some thought into that. And finally, to say that um, Rome wasn't built in a day. And, you know, my my key advice here is to really kind of start simple realize some tangible benefit from the optimization and the performance tooling that you start to introduce into your workflows um, so that you can gain the gain some tangible benefit and continue to refine your performance models as you grow uh, both in maturity and um, also in skill as well yes rich thank you so much for that uh that great uh walkthrough and i loved that showing people how to actually build their own pipeline um and i think it goes back to the maturity model that we were discussing earlier which is that you know a as you grow and mature you're going to add more stages you're probably already doing automated functional testing let's go ahead and add in a little bit of synthetic testing while it's in a staging or a uat environment hey you, you've already built these great apm monitoring scripts, can you deploy those agents on your staging database and find out whether you know, a new feature is having a backend impact or not? Um, so just a couple of quick housekeeping pieces before we um, uh, get to QA time. So uh, this webinar is brought to you by Rigor and Optimal. So uh, Rigor is a cloud-based uh, web performance solution designed to help you find and fix performance issues before they happen. Um, where in that uh, great diagram that Rich just showed, we provide the synthetic monitoring side as well as uh, sort of the uh, automated and optimization analysis. So those 300 performance best practices helping you find all sorts of ways to make your site go faster. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Rich to talk a little bit about This is Optimal and the consulting service that they offer. And if you have any questions um, in your go-to meeting control panel, you should see a little thing over on the side. Oh, we see some questions coming in. That's awesome. Keep putting those in and uh, we'll answer them uh, just after this. Take it away, Rich. So I, I work for a company called Optimal and we're a team of web performance and optimization specialists. We work across a range of different tools, including performance, optimization, and load testing tools. And we also help our clients to prepare for um, peak events such as Black Friday and Cyber Monday. In addition, we also work with some of the major CDN vendors out there to help with CDN configuration and management and also for strategic projects such as uh, image and uh, resource optimization as well as traffic management and bot management as well. So if you'd like to get in contact with us, um, uh, website is thisisoptimal.com and you can email us uh, hello at thisisoptimal.com as well. Excellent. Let's get on to QA. Our, uh, our first question is um, when you say load, do you mean DOM UX or page load time, above the fold, fully loaded? You know, Rich, mm -hmm. this is always a challenge in our, our industry is people will say load or even people will say performance and it has so many different meanings. When you were saying load a lot during this presentation, yeah. uh, what did you particularly mean or what are some of the ways that a lot of people will use that term in the context of performance? 
Uh, yeah, it's it's a very good question. So. Um, when I when I talk about sort of load and stress testing, typically uh, what we're talking about there is the uh, the network transmission of a particular page. So normally this would be um, mm. the HTML, possibly the CSS, and some API calls, and then also the um, uh, possibly some of the static assets like the images as well. Um, when we talk about um, you know, sort of web performance in general, you know, there's there's 30, if not 40 different metrics out there. And, you know, um, you know, typically we've been looking at uh, page load. So um, this is like the, the onload event. Um, prior to that, we were looking at sort of end-to-end -end loading, which, you know, was the, the loading of the entire page. You know, as we've become sort of more mature in the industry, and, you know, and Google has really kind of spearheaded these efforts here is to actually start focusing on customer metrics. Because, you know, if you if you look at the way that a modern web page is being built, you know, it, it doesn't start loading and then flash, everything appears. You know, the, the page actually sort of renders over time and the and so you end up with uh, a, a series of you know quite a quite a different sort of performance metrics. So these days, you know, as we're as we're looking at sort of you know the the page load, you know, we're looking at metrics such as um, first contentful paint and first meaningful paint. You know, when we're actually beginning to see objects physically appearing on the page, and then we're also looking at other metrics like uh, visually complete, where the above the fold render has has completed. Um, and then finally, you know, other metrics like uh, time to interactive, where you know the the user can uh, fully interact with the page and is able to you know click buttons and the page is responsive to the end user. So yeah, it, it, it is a little complicated because there are so many metrics out there, and you know, um, you know, with a lot of clients, they'll say, you know, we want a, a five second page load time or a three second page load time, and then the question is, you know, what what does that actually really mean? So yeah, it's it's important to sort of define up front exactly what metric we're talking about. Yeah, and I'll actually do a, a shameless plug, but it's free, so it's great. On the Rigor uh, blog, we actually wrote just a couple of weeks ago a great um, article about what different metrics and how they align to different business metrics. I think the real answer to this question is not like, should you care about on load versus DOM complete versus fully loaded? Mm -hmm above the fold, it's all of these are different things. And for some customers, those metrics are super important. For other types of customers, different metrics are important. And we're not even talking about, you know, custom user timings that you can sort of drop on the browser for your own custom metric. So it, it really comes down to what are you trying to accomplish as a business? Um, is that display or is that making sure that the call to action works? Um, and there's different answers as to what metrics kind of can more benefit a different type of business, and then that's the metric you should be trying to track. Um, yeah. Tangent aside, um, so we've got a great question here from Allah. In a performance budget, um, you're saying no image is larger than a particular size, but what's the less mm -hmm. than? Is there some sort of guidance when you're doing performance budgets to make sure that like your images aren't, that, that you're still creating a great experience even while sort of minimizing, um, making sure that you don't have too much content? Yeah, that, that, that's also a really good question. So it's interesting because I remember working with a particular client and, you know, I sort of pointed out to them at the time that, you know, a lot of their images were were really oversized and you know oversized images kind of come in a in a few different uh, areas you know ultimately overall we're looking at bite size but also we're looking at the um the physical size of the image as well so you know if you um if you take an image and you load it on a web page the original source image may be 2000 pixels by 1000 pixels but then you've rescaled it down to say you know 100 pixels by 200 pixels and you know as a as a result of that you know you're you're unnecessarily downloading a whole load of extra bytes and then just uh, shrinking down the image so immediate, immediately that that becomes sort of bad practice to to do that the other things that typically would bloat an image out, you know, would be, you know, some of the metadata that might be included in the image. And so, you know, a general best practice as you're moving into delivery is you want to kind of strip out some of that metadata unless it's important. And then finally, the, the thing that would really impact an image is, you know, for, a, for an image that's in a format like JPEG, uh, you have the ability to change the quality of the image. And, you know, that, that quality is um, something that, 
you know, as you, as you sort of um, decrease the quality of the image, the file size comes down, but the um, the actual output of the image starts to look grainy or starts to appear with artifacts. And so it's it's really important to, you know, work with designers to, you know, get their approval as you're, as you're sort of uh, optimizing content, because, you know, this one particular client that I had had gone so far to optimize all of their images that, you know, the images started to look very grainy and, you know, so the, the experience started to degrade after that. And uh, eventually, you know, the team that I was working with at the time had to sort of say to say to this uh, particular group, hey, you, you guys have actually over optimized your images, you know, they're, they're not looking as good anymore. And you really need to um, kind of find that balance between, you know, sort of uh, what, what looks great and presents well on the page versus, um, you know, sort of getting it getting it down to a very lean size. You know, Rich, I'm really glad you brought that up because I think it reinforces the fact that, you know, it's performance is not the end goal improving the business is the end goal and so if you're just watching performance you're like oh my gosh look how small my images are like you could make you could have zero images and i bet you it would be really fast uh we're, we have a question at the moment about uh javascript front-end frameworks and how large they can be like you could remove all of those and it would be really fast but then your experience starts to suffer and then maybe the call to action conversion rate or the shopping cart abandonment rate, whatever the business metrics starts to suffer. So it, it really goes to show like, yes, watch these performance metrics, but also be measuring how is my site getting better or worse at its function to the business. Um, so we've got time for one more question and there's still a couple of other questions beyond that. So uh, the, to the folks that we don't get to, don't worry, we will send you an email after this talking about Jenkins X and some other things. So um, Rich, the final question is from Paul. Um, when you were mentioning performance budget limits, you talked about a limit in KD for JavaScript. He's working on his first um, Angular JS, but really this could probably work for sort of any single page app, front end heavy JS framework. Um, it's much larger than your performance budget. Is there mm -hmm. anything special you could con should consider with performance budgets when you're dealing with sort of uh, single page apps and client side rendering? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the big thing is to really sort of consider uh, first of all, you know, what what is actually core to the initial experience of the of the website, and to start to load those those things up first. So you know, everything that we load on our web page, it goes in a in a sort of priority order, and you know, we have the ability to defer things that are not sort of core to that initial experience. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this a lot, Billy, but I, I certainly have with single page apps that so they tend to sort of load everything up front. And so that initial page load uh, tends to be slow and then the experience gets a lot faster as you begin to interact with that app. And it, it's because, you know, the, the libraries, you know, are sort of determined that, or, you know, the, the way that it's built is determined to just kind of bring everything in first to then make the experience seamless. So, you know, there's a couple of things you can do there. You can either sort of uh, prompt the user if you know that that uh, initial experience is going to be slow. You can let them know that, you know, the, the system is beginning to load. Uh, so it's at least informing them that something is happening on their behalf. The second thing to do is to um, to load only uh, what is core to that initial experience and then to start firing up service workers that can begin to uh, bring in some of the um, some of the functionality that's going to be used at a later stage within that interaction. So then you get kind of a, a quick interaction to begin with and then in the background you're using service workers to start bringing in some of that additional logic and additional content. All right, Rich, well, thank you so much. And um, by the way, everyone, if uh, you want to get faster, uh, check out our free speed and web performance report. It is available at rigor.com slash free. Um, I just wanna thank everyone for joining us today. A special thank you to Rich and Billy for sharing their insights. Uh, feel free to contact us if you have any additional questions. Now, if you found today's presentation insightful, we invite you to subscribe to our blog for a deep dive into the industry trends and best practices. Again, thank you so much for attending and have a wonderful day.